Hello, me. My name is Joe Prendable. I'm with Watson McDaniel. I'm the technical support manager for Watson McDaniel. And today we're going to do two groups. Really, just talk about steam trap surveys. Does everyone have an understanding what a trap survey is? A steam trap survey. Not really. I mean, I know we do some, but I don't okay. really understand what we do when we. Does do everybody it. know what a steam trap is? Mm-hmm. I always, you know, when you're not familiar with steam traps, I can remember that my first day when I got into the steam side of the industry, I was like. Steam trap. All right, you know, somebody stood there and said, "Oh, it's just like a valve that turns, opens and closes, opens and closes all day." Okay. Even in a simpler terms, you know, when we talk about inspecting and testing steam traps, why do we do it? Well, the the one line is always it saves money, but it's no different. Like in your house, I always put it in this term: when you go in your house and in your bathroom, you have your toilet in there. If you take the toilet lid off there, you see a float in there, and this thing's going up and down turns the water on and off based on that liquid level or the water level in the tank. That's really all a steam trap is doing. So just like in your home, if you stood there and you heard your toilet running, you're thinking, I'm wasting a lot of money going down the drain. If a trap fails open, that's all it's doing is allowing live steam to flow right through. You're wasting money that way. Or if for some reason it didn't want to turn back on, now you're backing up into your equipment side. So that reduces the efficiency and the operation of your system. So really in terms of while we do trap testing, that's the big thing. It maintains the system. It saves money. It saves energy. It reduces safety issues that may be attributed to traps blowing through. It saves the equipment. There's a lot of things that are involved with it. And it's a simple little trap. I mean, these are just you know some of the things that come off the top of my head. Loss of energy. When you, when you go by a building, you see all that, that vapor or the white plume coming off the vent lines. That's energy. That's energy just going to the atmosphere. It can also improve your system efficiency, reduce maintenance costs, minimizes potential safety issues. When we walk into buildings, you can hear banging going on. You see the pipes dancing around. A lot of times that's attributed to failed traps. This is for the guys, like the, the outside guys, the provides guys with system optimization. When we get the opportunity to do a trap survey, we get the opportunity to walk through the entire plant. And at that point, as you're walking through, you're not just looking at steam traps. There's everything that you guys get involved with, pipe, valves, fitting, safety relief valves, you know, fixtures, all kinds of different opportunities that come about. We can also become managers of their system. Now you can walk through, and once this, I'll show you the report at the end of the presentation, but at the end of the day, now we have a complete inventory of all their traps they have in there. Now we can help manage that system. We can actually make proper trap selections, reduce the trap inventory. Hey, I used to have 50 different models of traps. <coughs> now I only have 10. So it really helps the end user or the customer standardize and reduces inventory costs. It also develops a maintenance record. Now they have a, a plan that they can look at. So geez, I, I replaced this trap four or five times. What's going on here? Is it the right trap? Is there something else going on? So it really gives you a management tool as well as you know all the other points that we just uh, highlighted there. I threw this in there because I, I said the last slide. If you're not familiar with steam traps, and everybody because oh it's low hanging fruit, it's just a you know piece of metal that's in my system. Whether it's working or not, I don't care. It looks okay, but is it functioning? And you think about what these things do, and to keep it simple, I talk about a steam system whether it's you know fairly simple like this or the old homes that had the steam radiators in there they're all it's all a loop it's really a, nice. a circle this is what you want to do you generate your steam here at the boiler that feeds up through your steam distribution main when you think about it as soon as that steam leaves that boiler what happens to it that steam begins to condense back to a liquid it loses its heat energy so now we want to make sure we get that liquid out of the system that's where these guys come into play we we call it a drip trap. That's our first safety point. We want to make sure we get that liquid out of the steam system so we only have dry steam up here. We don't want water condensate flowing with the steam. So these are drip traps. And you think about it, what happens if this fails closed? Now all that moisture just continues to carry on down the line. And a lot of times that's where you hear the banging and your pipes dancing around. So for as small as they are, they are critical pieces of equipment. Again, 
Now we have a process trap over here. Maybe we're going into a steam kettle. That's all we're doing is you think about that steam as it gives up its energy, that heat energy, it condenses back to a liquid. <coughs> so if this trap were to fail wide open, now the steam's just gonna blow right through. Customer's gonna say, why is it taking my kettle so long to heat up? Production, production, production. <coughs> Time is everything today. So if the trap were to fail open, it's gonna blow right through. Maybe the trap fails close. Now that condensate can't get out, it backs up into the kettle. Again, why is it taking my kettle so long to heat up? Those are things that you normally look at. But you can see everything we talk about, we generate the steam, comes back, it's a loop. Whether we're going into a kettle, this is what we want to do. It makes the system very efficient at that point. When the traps blow wide open, what happens here is, you think about it, here's another loop. This return line is sized based on all those traps are working properly. As the traps start to blow through, all of a sudden, this guy becomes undersized. It can't accommodate that flash. Now we create pressure, and it affects everything in that loop. That's why it's really critical. And you go to the customer and say, are you interested in a trap survey? When's the last time you had one done? Four, five, six years ago, maybe. And you talk to them and say, well, any problems out in the system? Not that we're aware of. And then you say, what we're doing right now as far as doing a trap survey, we'll come out from Watts McDaniel. We let you guys be the managers. So we'll charge, depending on you know, travel time, time to bulk, we normally invoice maybe $1,200 to $1,500 for a day. That gives you the opportunity to put your markup on it. So you know, if you want to tag along, because they're boring, it's not the funnest thing to do but it gives you an opportunity to make some money on top of that as well as help your customer out. What's the best thing to, like, when you're trying to get a customer to, to do a trap survey? I mean, for that's, them to want to spend that kind of money, that's what's where, the best thing to say to them? You that's know, the to, first thing that comes up. They'll say, what? You know, say if we charge you guys $1,500 and you say, we're going to charge you $2,000. That's, that's the first roadblock. That's not my budget. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> it really is. And we'll find out why, at the end, how much money it's actually costing them on the utility side. But there's so many other things that come into play as far as, hey, we're going to charge you $2,000 per day. And, you know, we'll see the results of that based on the improvement of your system operation as well as your energy cost reduction. But what you're looking at as far as the cost it's already being paid for or being expended for based on the energy loss or production time. Right. So you really got to tie them back into it and say, okay, here's potentially what you could be losing on a daily rate. But on top of that, which really never comes back into the conversation is the loss of production time. How's that affecting my production? I could be making more toys or whatever, linking logs or whatever it is, a hundred more a day if I change out my trap and address all those issues. And how often do you recommend that they do this? How many? There's a, an analytical statistical ca calculation. On average, let's say if you had 100 traps in your facility, usually it's a 10% as a guideline, so every year you're going to have at least 10 failed traps in your mm -hmm. system. So you let the, you know, another year go by, two years, now you're 20 failed traps. We'll see at the end here, it really costs you a lot of money. And the cost of the, the traps themselves versus the energy loss is really a savings right there. Now you're going to save a lot more money. How do we test the traps? We could do a visual. You could stand there. And I put little illustrations in there. So if you're not familiar with one of the sight glasses, it actually gives you like a little window into the pipe. We can look at a test valve. Maybe the trap is just open and discharging right to the floor. We can do it on temperature. You guys have that Milwaukee infrared camera. That's a great tool, and I put a little couple of little illustrations there. And we can also do it with sound. It's called ultrasound. It's like a stethoscope. You can actually listen to the trap. So these are all the different testing methods. The sight glass that gets piped in actually has a glass window, so you can actually see how the trap is actually operating. Test valves. I like to do more of these. We only stock the three-quarter inch. I did a nice project up at the VA up in Connecticut. But this is nice. It's really just a ball valve, but you turn it 
now you're opening up a test port. So now you can actually see how the trap is operating. You see the on-off operation. If it's blowing right through, you know you have a failed trap. If nothing comes out, you know you have a trap that's failed closed. But it's a good, easy visual indication as far as is my trap working properly. A lot of times you'll go out, if you go along Interstate 81, the cogent plants, you'll see the piping run along the roadsides. You'll see these traps discharging. A lot of times it's a, just a continual blast. You know the traps have failed. <laughs> You go into the plate. Now oh, we, we can't change them out. Can't shut down. These are things. These are opportunities. Another thing is you ask the customer: Is the system operating the way it's designed to? No, it's taking 20 minutes, 45 minutes longer to heat up, or I can't get my temperatures. These are all indicators as far as are the traps working properly. <coughs> now this is with the uh, the Milwaukee infrared. This is nice, but you also always have to understand how these systems are actually operating at. They put the temperature up here in the corner, that's telling me I'm around 10 psi steam pressure. For every pressure, there's a corresponding temperature or temperature pressure relationship. So if I'm around 200, or if I'm around 10 psi, which is around 233 degrees, and I look here and it says stream trap failed open, you're looking at temperatures, saying, okay. I'm at 207 here. I think that's back. <coughs> 207 coming in. You should have looked at this last time. They're saying 78 degrees on the outlet. You know, condensate return temperature is. That's actually flipped around. I think that, that 78 is just uh, in about the uh, return the shading. So if it was the no, dark blue, it right. 78. And if it and was, was 52 over there, that's. Yeah. <coughs> So essentially what it's saying is they're looking at temperature on the inlet side of the trap. Those numbers, that's a hard slide to really comprehend because a float thermostatic trap is one of the more difficult traps, the most difficult trap to It really. looks like there's a plus sign that shows where, where the temperature reading is being taken. So the 207 is right oh, there. Oh, 7.1. Okay, <coughs> you're correct. That's and right. then over on the other one, it's 77. Okay, I'm looking at it up here. Sorry to display this So, so um, that's what you're looking for as far as trap operation. So they're saying down here my temperature, somebody picked that, yeah. is 200. So they're saying that's too high. It's not holding the condensate mm -hmm. back to allow it to subcool and allow my temperatures to drop. Normally on here, what we used to do years ago is actually put a temperature sensing device right here. That way you can actually see how the traps are operating. Because on a float thermostatic trap, now this one it says operating properly at 177 degrees F on the discharge. Okay, that's good. You could also, if you wanted to, test it right here at this point. Normally a float thermostatic trap is going to allow that condensate to drain as it's forming. So you don't see much of a temperature drop from your 230 to 3 degrees. It's normally very close to that saturation temperature. But these are nice tools. This gives you a, an insight view of what's going on on your pipe. You can do this on a heat exchanger or an air coil. Run that down the face of the coil or the heat exchanger and see what's going on as far as are the traps operating properly? Are they allowing the condensate to discharge? Or is it backing up into my system? That's one way of doing it. When we talk about ultrasonics, has so anyone ever seen the ultrasonic test guns? All it is is like a stethoscope, but it amplifies that sound. So basically you go out to each trap, put this probe onto the trap, and you can actually listen to it. Let's see if I did it right last night. Now this is a one trap. This is a, what we call the TD traps, the thermodynamic traps. And that's all there is inside there is that little disc. And you'll see the flash bubbles get on the top there. In a second, you'll hear how the traps actually sound when you're doing with the ultrasonic. It's one of the easiest traps to actually test. So right now it's closed. So if you had the headset on, you'd be like, okay, what's it doing? That's, that's about it. It's on and off. And when you have the headset on there, it's very audible. And that's really all you're listening for. It's an on-off trap. easiest trap to test. 
So are there uh, certain traps that fail more often than others? That's a question that always comes up. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with, you think about systems today and the lack of maintenance. Um, we were just over at Lancaster General last week. And, you know, they want to upgrade their, their system. But the, the original infrastructure of that hospital was still there. So their piping is grossly undersized. But you could put a trap in there and, you know, if they don't do it properly, you get, you get dirt, slag, rust come into the trap. And it could be failed that day, the same day. You know, that's what, your traps are crap. I don't, I don't want them anymore. <laughs> and they can come back to the factory. Uh, you look at them and say, geez, I know why it failed. But, I mean, that's an excellent question. I mean, these are things, too, that uh, you're seeing more and more of. They call them the trap station. Um, they're what you're looking for if you had a test valve in there. That's essentially what you're looking for. A lot more companies like universities are big for these things. So right now the trap is discharging and eventually it's going to close off. <laughs> now if I was listening with the ultrasonics, I'd say, okay, the trap is open. There, trap closed. So strainers are, are most important when putting in. Uh, in strainers on any component in a steam system are critical. And it's funny, you go out there, do you ever change your strainers? No, it's been there for 30 years. And if you could get the plug out, you know, literally there's no strainer left in there. There's no strain materials left in there. So, really, that's all you're listening for is the audible on the traps themselves. Now, that was a thermodynamic trap. Easiest trap to test. Inverted bucket traps. They're pretty much operational, very similar to the TD traps, the thermodynamic traps. It's an on-off. If you ever saw the internals on a, in a bucket trap, Looks like a soup can turned upside down with a little hole in the top, and it's just bobbing up and down. It's an on operation. These guys, we'll see in the video in a second, that's a float thermostatic trap. It's a constant modulation. And years ago, when I used to go out with testers with the guys from Spiric Sarco, I mean, they'd go up to a float thermostatic trap, put the little probe on, good, bad, and I'd challenge them tell me that trap is good or bad. It takes, you have to have an understanding of what's actually happening in the trap. You might have a heavy condensate load, a lot of condensate coming to that trap. So it's going to allow that little ball in there to elevate, meaning the trap is wide open. It's getting rid of the condensate. That's what you want it to do. Or if you come in there and you have a very light load, and there's not enough condensate to actually cause that float to elevate, <coughs> the trap's going to be closed. But for the most part, normal operation, it's just doing that little bobbing all the time. So it's very difficult in a lot of applications to tell whether or not that's working properly. <coughs> now, one reason we like to use both thermostatic traps on process, it's really two traps in one. You have the mechanical part. Now that float is elevated, it pulls the valve head off the seat. There's also a little air vent in there. So when the system is off, that system fills with either air or non-condensables. So here's a constant discharge on it right now. I have a very heavy load. And there's so much condensate in here coming in there right now, it's causing the temperature of the condensate to drop. That little air vent's going to eventually open up. Now the air vent's open. So now you actually have two pathways for that condensate to discharge. That's why you like to see them on process, like a heat exchanger, air coil. You talk to the unit heater guys anymore. They're expecting float thermostatic traps on their equipment. There's a little air vent. So you really have two traps in one. But it addresses all the issues when you're doing process temperature control, modulating control. It allows air to discharge right through. It doesn't cause a trap to fail close or go to a closed position. That's pretty pretty typical on a normal operation. You don't have that clean on off audible sound. So you're, things like this is good to test with the ultrasonic as well as the infrared temperature cameras. That way you can actually get a confirmation as far as where my temperatures are at. Is it operating properly? This, this is what it amounts to is going out with this little 
ultrasonic <coughs> test gun, putting that probe on each one of the traps, recording the trap model. And that's where it really comes into a, a comprehensive management tool for all of us. And what we've done with you guys down at Schreiber Foods. So this was a So when we do a trap survey report, we, we partnered a couple years ago with a company called NTRAC, and all they did was trap surveys for the refineries, particularly down in, in uh, Texas. And we'll put all this data in there as far as location of the trap, how's it being used, what's the system pressure, the elevation, manufacture, the model number, the connection size, whether it's NPT or flange how it's operating, you know, other notes that we might see in there. But now, from your standpoint, you know exactly what Schreiber Foods has at their facility. I mean, you can go through this thing. I don't think I can scroll down through. Here, I'm going to jump out of here once. <clears throat> now, with N-Track, ah, it didn't pop up. So now we know exactly what, as we go through there. Okay, that's a different view. But this is what we're doing. It's somebody else talks to the computer. <laughs> and what we normally do is, so you can see there's different trap manufacturers that are in there. And this is where we get into that crossover, and, I'll, and I'll, we'll get into that in the next slide or two. But now I'll look at, as far as, when a customer calls in here and they say, I have a Spirex Sarco model FTI-125. Do you guys have that? Like, well, we could get it for you, or do we want to stay with Watson McDaniel? Those are the things I always look at first. You know, if I'm not familiar with that model, it looks like, what is that, an FTI-125? Being in steam all my life, that's all I know is all these different model numbers. So I know that's a float thermostatic trap. The I designated say in line, meaning the pipe goes straight through. And this is the operating pressure, 125 PSI. So now I can go to our crossover guy and say, oh, it's an FTT dash. In our case, we could use a 145 with a three quarter inch. And again, we're recording all this. So when the outside guys come with us, you know, somebody actually stands there with a little clipboard, putting all this information down. And then you can extrapolate that out and say, okay, here's what I found the last time we did Schreiber Foods. And here, see, the traps. Okay, well, Watts McDaniel, what was going on with these guys? And here's the Sarcos, and there's our replacement. So that really gives the customer, again, as well as you guys, what we would recommend as far as a replacement. And generally, when I'm looking at that, I'm going to select something that matches the capacity of the existing trap, as well as the piping connections, so they don't have to go in there and make piping changes, it's going to be a drop-in replacement. And then we talk about, you know, what do we have there? How many traps? Now these are the failed open traps, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven traps. So if I go into my failed cost report, it's picking up a lot more traps. They're all failed open. You can see across the board, you say, wow, $12,000, that's a lot of money. Well, you, I always put this in here. This access database is based on if these traps are in operation 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So what the software company does is we'll say, okay, 
that's going to be a very high number. And the default value as far as we're going to say these traps don't fail 100% wide open. The default value is only 33%. So that really makes a little more conservative as far as the failure number. So even there at $12,000 a year, you think, okay, I don't run 24-7, 365 days a year. Let's say six months out of the year. So even if you take half of that, you're still saving over $6,000 a year. But that doesn't take into account the, the effect it has on the system itself. Is it causing systems to slow down? Am I reducing my capacity on the process? Am I getting a lot of equipment out when I should be getting maybe 10 or 20% more? This is just saying, this is how much steam we're actually losing. It doesn't take into account the, the impact it has on the system operation. So as far as the crosses, is, is everyone familiar with the, the Watson catalog? Mm-hmm. You can go back through there. Come on. <coughs> so here's the, here's the different traps as far as a crossover guy. But you still have to understand as far as you know, material construction, we're looking at are they cast iron, are they ductile iron, are they carbon steel. But the inline, when you look at some of the terminology, that just means the pipe's going to come in from the left, go straight through out to the right side. And when you can go into the different traps, and this, this is a nice guide that... <coughs> and things like this, I, I, would, I would encourage you if you, you know, if you're not sure, I wouldn't even waste time on it. You know, somebody says, I've got a Spirex Arco FT15-125. He's like, oh, you know, I have no clue what that is. And for the amount of product you guys are responsible for, I wouldn't expect you to. Um, best way to get a hold of me is on a cell phone. Because as soon as you tell me what the model number is, I pretty much have, well, I know exactly. The nice thing about a lot of this traps anymore, not only the, uh, the interchangeable, As far as, okay, if I had to buy a new trap, I'm going to go over here. Very common trap right here, these guys. Open. See how computer savvy I am? Mm -hmm. I don't want that open. Well, I think it is open. Just hit your plus. You see where the plus and minus are up on the bar? Oh, there you yep. go. Oh, oh. <coughs> I still can't get rid of that other screen now. I think that thing in the middle. Uh, yeah, in the middle part, there's like a little oval. Uh, right, go down a little bit. Yep, right, right oh. there. Dang. You can draw that down. <laughs> <laughs> Always appreciate the help. No problem. There we go. It's the boys that play games that have. No problem. You're talking about. The nice thing about that, these are the other things I look at when I walk through a site. So, for years, in, even in this marketplace, when Spark Sarco was located up in Allentown, for this little geographic area in the northeast of PA, uh, there were seven of us. I, I worked 15 years with Spark Sarco. We were out almost like your guys are. This, every week, the same customer, just going back in, keeping in touch. So there was a lot of installed base with the Spirex Arco. And a lot of times you would see something like this. Now we call it the WFT, Watson Floating Thermostatic. A lot of acronyms with Watson McDaniel. And this is a, a typical floating thermostatic. And unlike what we were talking about, the inline, this is what we call a parallel connection. There's a top in, pipe comes in, condensate's coming on the top, condensate goes back out all on the same side. So we call that a parallel top-in, bottom-out connection. 
The nice thing about these anymore, if you wanted to do a complete trap change out from a, a Sarco FT, this has the same center line connection, so piping drops right in there. But more importantly, the six bullets on the cover, you could actually take those out. Our cover mechanisms, that's what they call that thing. And so what we would be looking at would be So here's the inside. So here's that cover for the six bolts. All these internals are connected to that cover. So instead of replacing that trap going in there, breaking the piping, spending a lot more time, you could actually just replace that cover assembly that's on the front. Six bolts, that whole assembly, the internals pull out, you put a new cover assembly back in, now you're back up and running. Our traps, our WFTs versus the Sarco have the same cover <coughs> assemblies up to an inch and a quarter connection pipe size. So those cover assemblies are interchangeable. So a customer says, somebody like New York Hospital, I've got parts for Spark Sarco, I'm not changing out my inventory. I can help you out on that. These are things you look at. Um, I used to call on the York Hospital, did a lot of projects when they were doing their pumps years ago. So much of the product is interchangeable. We talk about float thermostatics, interchangeable. The little TD traps everybody uses interchangeable, same face-to-face, -face, same capacity. So across the board, we have so much interchangeability on these things. The big advantage is, is we're located here in Pennsylvania. You guys are right here in Pennsylvania. You're only an hour away from the factory, let's say. But the biggest thing is, two big things. Watson McDaniel is U.S. domestically made. The castings for all our traps, regulators, pumps, they're all U.S. To product, even the castings. It's all done here in the U.S. Sarco, a lot of their stuff is coming in from overseas. When we took some of these, if they had to sign the ST forms, they can't really do it other than they're, they build in a labor cost to justify and say, okay, yeah, we can do it. We can say the castings are actually sourced here in the United States. The other big advantage is, though, Spark Sarco is a publicly held company. So they have to build in a margin of profit to keep the shareholders happy. That was always a big thing back in the Sarko days, where Watson McDaniel was owned by one guy, Richard Pickett. Richard's happy with what's going on. He doesn't have to you know, build in a profit level to keep shareholders happy. So we're always very competitively priced. And a lot of times you'll sit down with an end user and they'll say, it's got to be cheaper product then. And you can sit there put a product side by side, do an evaluation, materials, weights, wall thicknesses, and they're still going to say, can't be. But Spark Sarka, they really do build in a considerable amount of profit into their product just to maintain their profit levels and keep the shareholders. Working with the IT guys, we have all these nice little options at the top here up in the black banner. I want to get one that says sizing tools or something to that effect. Anyone ever use uh, TLV's website? We try not to. Yeah, it's I tell you what. Terrible. Oh. <laughs> I, I usually just do searches online and not even go to their website if I'm trying to find a spec sheet. Their website, <laughs> their website though, is I love it. I mean, from the aspect of the calculations on there, because more and more when you go out and we do engineering seminars, you can go to the Jacobs, you can go to all the Vanderwiles, all the bigger engineers throughout the U.S. It's amazing. The younger generation guys, and I'm the old guy, but they'll already say, don't you have a calculator for that? Can I do that online? You can go on to TLV, you can go on to Spark, Sarco. Jacobs has did a job for Wyeth. And I sat there, I'm looking at the, the calculation numbers, and it's like point, you know, three, three, three. And I was like, I know where you got this, man. They rely on electronic calculators so vivid, you know, so much. Um, I actually use TLV app on my phone. I mean, it, it saves time, and, and you know, no one ever questions it then either. It's hey, if it's coming off a, a you know a software program. Hopefully, we're going to get there. I mean, these are some of the things that I look at though. Let's see if I can get down a little bit. You can see. I mean, this web page was already probably done two years ago, so it's it's really outdated. But these are the options you can look at. And a lot of times, if somebody calls me anymore, I can print it out. I can say, when somebody says, I've got a question on a, on a regulator, 
I said, okay, you wanted the products. You can either go through the icon that we had down there or up on the top. It opens up all the different categories as far as the products. So you have your traps, your pumps, your regulators, control valves, and our heat exchanger packages, all the accessories. But let's say if somebody said, hey, I've got a, a trap. I'm not sure which one I need. The nice thing about this is gives you a little information on how the traps work, but now you can scroll down and based on what they're looking for, is it a thermodynamic, thermostatic, floating thermostatic, it sort of gives you that quick visual as far as, okay, now I'm looking at a floating thermostatic, let's say the ones we were just looking at, how is it piped? Oh, it's top in, bottom out, so okay, now I can just select on my traps. different trap options. Let's say I want this guy. You can see they, they built the calculators on each product. So you can go in there. These are the questions that we need to know as far as how we actually size a trap. So it really assists you as far as understanding what's required. And all I'm looking for is as far as questions when you're talking to someone. What's the steam pressure coming to the trap? I'll plug that in. Discharge pressure. They're going to say, I have no clue. You might throw an, an arbitrary number in there and say, I'm going to put in maybe 5 PSI. And these are things that we saw at the top there. It sort of helps you guideline through here. But if we were to plug those numbers in, let's just say like that one trap we were looking at. The, let's say my steam pressure was 125 PSI. And maybe my back pressure was 10. Okay, so it's looking for... Minimum differential. Minimum differential is all that is is your inlet pressure minus whatever that back pressure you're trying to discharge. So let's say the back pressure was 10 psi. So now I know my minimum differential, 125 minus 10 is 115. I don't even have to put a actual load in there. Say so somebody says I don't know, I'm not really sure. Now it gives you an array of all the different traps that are rated to operate at 125 psi across the board from the three-quarter inch, and we can keep going. But now we can see the capacity of each one of those traps based on those conditions of operation. <coughs> and these are things then you could ask. Don't ask me why they pulled it off. So let's say we just pick this one. Hopefully it'll come back someday. So now I've got all my trap information. <coughs> I can pull off the catalog sheets, the installation operation manual. I can even get a condensed installation and operation manual. While they pulled it back, I could actually generate a quote, which we were, for a short period of time, able to do on our phone. So it would pull up a list price, and then from there you could put your sale price onto that. It would just generate a, a list price, but you could actually go in and it would do something like this. And you could put little notes in there. But Christine knows Bob. Thank you. Bob was like, I don't want everyone to know our pricing. It's Bob, everyone knows our pricing. <laughs> and everyone doesn't know the discount structure from each distributor. I said, so when you're out in the field, or if you want to do something very quickly, or take that information and put it into your quote system, it eliminates having to go to a paper price guide and doing all that good stuff. Because then you could actually put all that information in, save the quote. Those are things I'm hoping that are come down the line here where you'll have a password you can actually log in. Instead of having to call our office, do you have it in stock? You'll be able to pull all that information off. So these are things that are moving forward with. Because I could sign in right now, put my name in there with a password, but right now this is all <coughs> the options we have available. But it really helps as far as providing all the information that you would need. You know, if the customer wanted the, the catalog page with it, you could attach that to the quote, the installation operation manual. Those are all things that help as far as doing the crossovers on these. Oh, don't log out. You have to save it. Pardon me? You have to save that later for the outside guys. 
So Jason doesn't have to come back in. She's and conne he's connected to the internet. You yeah, know. That, okay. it's, yeah, it's not the. He's yeah. connected he can, now. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. not the closing out that. Yeah, that would do that. All right, stuff. dinosaur now. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I could even do this on my phone right now, and then unfortunately without the price, so I'll have to get my price book out. I put it in here. And here's your list price, and I could call the factory. Is it in stock? And make that note instead of you know Jim and I were talking because. If we're out on the field, just like this, I'm not going to respond until the, maybe the next time I'm going to either pull it off of a sheet is or something like that. that but we were talking, I mean, everything today is, I need it now. You get the phone call, I need it within 10 minutes. And if you don't respond, you know, if you respond later in the afternoon, oh, I'm sorry, I already have it taken care of opportunities are coming and going that fast anymore and those are things that I look at as far as a resource to make sure that we provide all the tools necessary because you guys have so much different product to be involved with and to, to try to understand this you know, turn this one off somebody wants one you're a wanted man But those are, these are the things that really, even from an end user standpoint, or engineering, everybody wants that information at the click of a button. And that's where the world's really going to. Uh, and that's what we need to help support you guys as well as your customers to really make our product that much easier to access, get the information, the pricing, and get it out to the field. So what can we do to help persuade Bob? I've heard it like he's hiring an IT person. Because um, okay. believe it or not, they just had it to, well, with Windows, Windows just abandoned Windows 7. Mm -hmm. Well, once it just abandoned Windows 7, only for that reason. They're, they're fine. I mean, this laptop, I've upgraded my, myself. I was like, I don't want to work back on Windows 8 or, you know, it, it's, it's a, keep everything up to date. Those are the things that we really got to push for. Outside of that, no one, as far as manufacturing, does very little marketing. Everything is web-based. So essentially, that's your marketing tool. And the better you make that tool, the more likely you are going to have people coming in, at least giving you the opportunity where in the past. It, it just didn't happen. But these, these calculators, it's, it's not just for traps. You can do your pumps. You can do the regulators. Um, you know, apparently, somebody got in there and corrupted our website a little bit because it's not there anymore but the nice thing about this is it's really a good learning tool as far as hey, I'm not sure what I need to ask I need to get back one more. but even on the pumps it, it, it gives you a, a guideline or a roadmap as far as where we need to be so it's just I wanted to do a pressure motor pump but at least it gives you all the information. And what it does is walk you through as far as what types we're looking for. And it gives a description of each one. But once you get in there, there's the information again as far as what we need. And you can sort of plug that in there. But it's amazing anymore when you talk to a customer and ask these questions, a lot of times is, I'm not sure. Yeah. And there's where the opportunity where we come into play then, you know, or call somebody an IPS, hey, can we go out and visit this person? Let's go see them, let's help them out. Once you get to that point, now you're the you're the point person. This guy came out, they helped me out. That's really where a lot of the opportunities are coming from now. Because out at the end user level, where they used to have, you know, a half dozen, ten guys or individuals in a maintenance group, now they're down to two or three people. We were just uh, over at Lancaster General. And I was over there with Vic. They wanted a new heat exchanger design. But when you run the numbers, it's like, you, they don't even have the infrastructure to put this thing in. So then when we meet with the facilities guy, will you tell me what we need? So that's what I did with Vic. I mean, we sized all the piping up for them. I mean, there's really no knowledge base out there, even when they're considered the facilities engineer. And, and it's amazing how much you see going on out in the field anymore. And the other thing you hear is, Steam's antiquated. Steam is 
when you look at production in energy, it's like the Superman compared to water. <coughs> I'm going to water. I mean, there's advantages of having hydronics, but there are huge advantages, especially when you get into high demands, high energy needs, and production is everything. I mean, all the food and bev you guys have around here, steam is everything for them. And then you get in a little further in production, how many units can I get out today? And this is where we come in to really help them <coughs> maintain and provide that efficiency in their system. And, so, and we keep evolving, and a lot of the stuff, even in our current product, product catalog, it's, it's outdated. I mean, we have new control valves. Clinton just did a nice job with some two and a half inch stainless steel valves, uh, things like that. Heat exchanger packages, huge opportunities, hospitals, universities, the food and bevs, whether it's a paint and frame, shell and tube, we can do those packages now. Um, and instead of going with, you know, half a dozen steam traps at a $2,000, now you're looking at projects of twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, which once you're the design criteria, the lead point, you're pretty much locked in. Um, and that's probably what will be over at Lancaster General. Now, the one thing I, I, I mentioned is to Vic, I said, Watson really doesn't give the distributors the, I'll call it the full scope. We always try to protect distribution. I mean, everything goes through distribution. But if we have, and I, I told Vic this, I mean, because Vic spent a day over at Lancaster, actually two days, so that's a lot of time for IPS. And if the project, or when the project comes through to fruition, you're pretty much price protected at that point. We're going to lock you in at a fabricated cost. Any other inquiries we get, Bob's going to put a you know, 10 or 15% add or on to that, saying, hey, these guys went out, they did the field work, i got to protect them. Because we, we see jobs that are done here in PA, and you're getting competitive quotes from the Midwest. I mean, they're coming in from everywhere, and it's like, if something happens, who's going to support it? The guy from the Midwest is going to come over here? No, and then it's going to be the Watson person, or, you know, whomever is in contact with the customer. So those are things we look at right now. That, <coughs> Huge opportunity with Watts right now. U.S. domestic, very price competitive, great field support. You guys are local. Uh, Vic made a, a nice uh, positive point for, I don't know if a customer was, he actually ran up to the factory, got a regulator, and got it back that night. Where you talk about the Spark Sarco, when you guys get inquiries, or who do you still perceive as the biggest competitor? Spark Sarco? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, they've sort of gone in the opposite direction where they don't have the field support anymore. They still have very high pricing. They're usually about 15 to 20 percent higher. Oh. But their lead times, <laughs> their lead well, times we're are... usually getting it through a distributor. Yeah. Right? Well, that's, that's yeah. the whole thing. We have an indirect contacts. So we don't know. I mean, it seems like a lot more because we are going through another distributor to try to get those Sarko items. When I was with Sarko, <coughs> the pricing levels as far as a discount for a distributor the, what they call the value added distributor was at a 0.6. Then they migrated to a 0.63. <coughs> so the value added now is a 0.63. This is their list times 0.63. That's the one where they're at, like a Cooney. Mm -hmm. um, other distributors that aren't considered a value added, they're at a 0.68 now. So there's a considerable price advantage here. But what's really becoming another factor is the lead time. I was over at uh, Haverford College. Um, they had a four inch control valve. Sarco was out like 12 weeks and we had it on the shelf. And it's things like that, it's like, oh geez, you know, local supplier, I can get it on the shelf, it went through distribution. Um, and that was one of the things I just, you know, they called us, they said, can we, do you guys have a valve? Who's your distributor? Now being over towards there at Lansdale, that was in a Joker branch, which they're not a stock, they didn't even have our stocking distributor class, but they were still much less expensive than a Sarco, but we had it on the shelf rather than 12 weeks. And it's, it's things like that where the opportunities have really come into play within the last several years. Don't see too much of the TLB very often anymore. <coughs> Even at Armstrong, you don't see any of that direct competition mm -hmm. from... Not too much. No. Every now and then we'll get a TLB. <coughs> That's because of IPS's fault. It, yeah, it's it funny, is. of all the areas that I travel into, I know it was IPS's customer in the past because uh, I got TLV. And 
TLB makes a nice product. They really do. Um, you know, typical any manufacturer, they're going to have hiccups along the way, but this is all their product design is very good product design. A little more costly though, uh, in their lead times now lead coming times. in. Yeah, it's, it's coming out huge issue. And that's that's one nice thing about Watson. I mean, I always bring up Bob Hickey, but Bob's sort of the old school. He likes inventory, so that's what we're doing. You know, that's where we come into play. Whether it's you know a four inch or six inch control valve, we have it on the shelf. Um, he's always looking for opportunities, and, and you know. You look at control valves, I'm going to go back to them because that, that market is for us as far as opportunities and growth has skyrocketed. Um, all our control valves now are stainless steel bodies, 316L, done away with, hey, we don't need cast iron, we don't need ductile. Uh, we, do the, we do our own pneumatic actuators, but now we've partnered with uh, PS Automation out of Germany. They do an electric actuator, very high-end actuator. And we've also just partnered with Siemens. <coughs> and now we have Siemens actuators on our valves as well. So there's huge opportunities in that market area, especially with all the food and beds here. They like the, the aspect of a stainless steel. All the food and beds seem to be migrating to stainless steel. So now you have a stainless steel 316L body on the control valves. They like that aspect. It's on the shelf, very competitively priced. Um, huge opportunities for us. But the, the steam trap surveys are great. Um, it, but it doesn't really lock you into the end user at that point. You have to have that, that relationship anymore. Because it's funny with Vic over at, uh, I'm going to use Vic over at Lancaster General. They had Spire Sarko come in and do the trap survey. And then Rich over at the Lancaster General gave Vic, he goes, do you guys have replacement traps for these failed traps? So it's like, okay, yeah. And, and there's for pricing and availability. And as far as geographic, you guys are right here. If I need it in a pinch, I can go up to the factory or someone at IPS is going to have it on the shelf for you. So you guys have a huge opportunity with Watson right now. And I'm, I'm not saying that just because I work for Watson. I've been around long enough where I can see opportunities where they are. And you can see the, the, the drawback of Spark, Sarco. Um, they really only have two guys in this marketplace. Huge geographic areas now, unlike it used to be. They have Dave Walters, I don't know if you ever talked with Dave. Mm -hmm. um, then they hired a guy back, Clark Vinter, that was here, <coughs> probably away from the company for 10 years or so. Those are the only two guys I know that are in the geographic area. But now with, uh, with Watson, now we have, uh, geez, within the last two months, we've hired four more outside people. <coughs> All ex-Sarco guys. Good or bad, I don't know, but we have them. New guy in New Jersey, new guy in New York City, a guy up in Connecticut. Uh, we just hired the guy out there in Chicago. Which to me anymore, as far as the support, that's really where the steam in is. The end user needs that support. Trap surveys gives you an invite to walk around the plant. And if I was a distributor guy, <laughs> I'd love that because then I could walk around and say, well, Joe's just checking traps there today, but yeah. in the meantime, yeah. I see electric pumps here, I see, you know, all opportunities, a wealth of offer opportunities. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate I learned a lot today. I'm excited.